Good morning. I'm Bob Munger, and welcome to Beaverton's First United Methodist Church online worship service. As we look forward with a positive attitude for better things to come, please join us in worship and prayer and song. Thank you. praise leader here at Beaverton First, and we are so thrilled you could join us today. Before we get started, let's join together in our vision statement. Here at the heart of Beaverton, Christ calls us to feed our community, body, mind, and spirit. You know, it's been another busy week. I, I keep joking that I'm, I'm intaking uh, news from a fire hose at this point. It's really a lot going on. And it's really nice to be able to join together with you um, in a really peaceful, centering place. So um, I thank you for that. As we get started today, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Lord, in a polarized and divisive world, we can allow so much to separate us. Choosing to love and pray for those with whom we disagree, those who persecute or mistreat us, it's the lifestyle to which you call us. And still, we look for someone to blame. We divide the world into us and to them. Lord, help us find a different way to relate to each other. Help us build relationships not based on power, but grounded in love. Help us love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Teach us that your call to love will change our own connection to humanity. In your name we ask this. Amen. Thank you. 
Good morning. Our scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 to 45. Jesus is speaking these words from the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe in light of what we've gone through in the past week, it's very appropriate that we hear these words today. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So ends the reading of the word. Time. I'm sure you've heard this. This is the argument that only time can solve the problem of racial injustice. Only time can bring integration into being. Just be nice and just be patient and, and wait 100 or 200 years and the problem will work itself out. And I think that is an answer to that myth. And that is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I'm absolutely convinced that in so many instances, the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme righteous of our nation, have used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals who are willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. And so it is necessary to help time and to realize that the time is always right to do right. With this faith, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children Black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the word of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Good morning and welcome to our online worship. I'm Pastor Jefferson Chow and today we will be honoring the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with a sermon he wrote on November 10th, 1957 at Howard University, Alabama. Even though this sermon was written 63 years ago, it connects with today's issues. Please enjoy this sermon from Dr. King Jr as Beaverton First United Methodist Church delivers his words.
I want to turn your attention to this subject, loving your enemies. It's so basic to me because it is a part of my basic philosophical and theological orientation. The whole idea of love, the whole philosophy of love. In the fifth chapter of the Gospel as recorded by St. Matthew, we read these very arresting words flowing from the lips of our Lord and Master. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Certainly these are great words, words lifted to cos cosmic proportions. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far as to say that it just isn't possible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. They will go on to say that this is just an additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound. But far from being an impractical idealist, Jesus has become the practical realist. The words of this text glitter in our eye with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization. Love even for enemies. Now let me hasten to say that Jesus was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. And we cannot dismiss this passage as just another example of hyperbole, just a sort of exaggeration to get over the point. This is a basic philosophy of all that we hear coming from the lips of our master. Because Jesus wasn't playing, because he was serious. We have the Christian and moral responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how we can live out this command and why we should live by this command. Now, let us deal with this question. How do you go about loving your enemies? I think the first thing is this. In order to love your enemies, you must begin by analyzing self. And I'm sure that seems strange to you, that I start out telling you this morning that you love your enemies by beginning to look at, at self. It seems to me that this is the first and foremost way to come to an adequate discovery of the how of the situation. Now, I'm aware of the fact that some people will not like you, not because of something you have done to them, but they just don't like you. I'm quite aware that so, some people aren't going to like the way you walk. Some people aren't going to like the way you talk. Some people aren't going to like you because you can do your job better than they can do theirs. Some people aren't going to like you because other people like you and because you're popular and because you're well-liked. They aren't going to like you. Some people aren't going to like you because your hair is a little shorter than theirs or your hair is a little longer than theirs. Some people aren't going to like you because your skin is a little brighter than theirs. Others aren't going to like you because your skin is a little darker than theirs. So that some people aren't going to like you, they're going to dislike you, not because of something you've done to them, but because of various jealous reactions and other reactions that are so prevalent in human nature. But after looking at these things and admitting these things, we must face the fact that an individual might dislike us because of something that we've done deep down in the past, some personality attribute that we possess, something that we've done 
deep down in the past and we've forgotten all about it. But it was something that aroused the hate response within the individual. That is why I say begin with yourself. There might be something within you that arouses the tragic hate response in the other individual. This is true in our international struggle. We look at the struggle, the ideological struggle between communism on the one hand and democracy on the other. And we see the struggle between America and Russia. Now, certainly we can never give our allegiance to the Russian way of life, to the communistic way of life, because communism is based on an ethical relativism and a metaphysical materialism that no Christian can accept. When we look at the methods of communism, a philosophy where somehow the end justifies the means, we cannot accept that because we believe as Christians that the end is pre-existent in the means. But in spite of all the weaknesses and evils inherent in communism, we must at the same time see the weaknesses and evils within democracy. Democracy is the greatest form of government, to my mind, that man has ever conceived. But the weakness is that we have never touched it. Isn't it true that we have often taken necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes? Isn't it true that we have often in our democracy trampled over individuals and races with the iron feet of oppression? Isn't it true that through our Western powers, we have perpetuated colonialism and imperialism, and all of these things must be taken under consideration as we look at Russia. We must face the fact that the rhythmic beat of the deep rumblings of discontent from Asia and Africa is at bottom a revolt against the imperialism and colonialism perpetuated by Western civilization all these many years. The success of communism in the world today is due to the failure of democracy to live up to the noble ideals and principles inherent in its system. And this is what Jesus means when he said, how is it you can see the mote in your brother's eye and not see the beam in your own eye? Or rather, how can you see the splinter in your brother's eye and fail to see the plank in your own eye? This is one of the human tragedies of nature. So we begin to love our enemies and love those persons that hate us, whether in collective life or individual life, by looking at ourselves. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. A second thing that an individual must do in seeking to love his enemy is to discover the element of good in his enemy. And every time you begin to hate that person and think of hating that person, realize that there is some good there and look at those good points which will overbalance the bad points. I've said to you on many occasions that each of us is something of a schizophrenic personality. We're split up and divided against ourselves. And there is something of a civil war going on within all of our lives. There is a recalcitrant south of our soul revolting against the north of our soul. And there is this continual struggle within the very structure of every individual life. There is something within all of us that causes us to cry out with Ovid, the Latin poet. I see and approve the better things of life, but the evil things I do. There is something within all of us that causes us to cry out with Plato, that the human personality is like a charioteer with two headstrong horses 
each wanting to go in different directions. There is something within each of us that causes us to cry out with Goethe. There is enough stuff in me to make both a gentleman and a rogue. There is something within each of us that causes us to cry out with Apostle Paul. I see and approve the better things of life, but the evil things I do. Somehow the isness of our present nature is out of harmony with the eternal oughtness that forever confronts us. And this simply means this, that within the best of us, there is some evil and within the worst of us, there is some good. When we come to see this, we take a different attitude toward individuals. The person who hates you most has some good in him. Even the nation that hates you most has some good in it. Even the race that hates you most has some good in it. And when you come to the point where you look in the face of every man and see deep down within him what religion calls the image of God, you begin to love him in spite of. No matter what he does, you see God's image there. There is an element of goodness that he can never slough off. Discover the element of good in your enemy, and as you seek to hate him, find the center of goodness and place your attention there, and you will take on a new attitude. Another way you love your enemy is this. When the opportunity presents itself for you to defeat your enemy, that is the time when you must not do it. There'll come a time, in many instances, when the person who hates you the most, the person who has misused you the most, the person who has gossiped about you the most, the person who has spread false rumors about you the most, there will come a time when you will have an opportunity to defeat that person. It might be in terms of recommendation for a job, it might be in terms of helping that person to make some move in life. That's the time you must do it. That is the meaning of love. In the final analysis, love is not this sentimental something that we talk about. It's not merely an emotional something. Love is creative, understanding goodwill for all men. It is the refusal to defeat any individual. When you rise to the level of love of its great beauty up in that system, you love, but you seek to defeat the system. The Greek language is very powerful at this point. It comes to our aid beautifully in giving us the real meaning and depth of the whole philosophy of love. And I think it is quite apropos at this point. For you see, the Greek language has three words for love. Interestingly enough, it talks about love as eros, that's one word for love. Eros is a sort of aesthetic love. Plato talks about it at great, a great deal in his dialogues, a sort of yearning of the soul for the realm of the gods. And it's come to us to be a sort of romantic love, though it's a beautiful love. Everybody has experienced Eros in all of its beauty when you find some individual that is attractive to you and that you pour out all of your like and all of your love on that individual. That is Eros, you see. And it's a powerful, beautiful love that is given to us through all the beauty of literature we read about it. Then the Greek language talks about philia. And that's another type of love that's also beautiful. It's a sort of intimate affection between personal friends. And this is the type of love that you have for those persons that you're friendly with, that your intimate friends or people that you call on the telephone and you go to have dinner with and your roommate in college and that type of thing. It's a sort of reciprocal love. On this level, you like a person because that person likes you. You love on this level because you are loved. You love on this level because there's something about the person you love that's likable to you. This too is a beautiful love. You can communicate with a person. You have certain things in common. You like to do things together. This is philia. 
the Greek language comes out with another word for love. It's the word agape. And agape is more than eros. Agape is more than philia. Agape is something of the understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. It's a love that seeks nothing in return. It's an overflowing love. It's what theologians would call the love of God working in the lives of men. And when you rise to love on this level, you begin to love men, not because they're likable, but because God loves them. You look at every man and you love him because you know God loves him. And he might be the worst person you've ever seen. And this is what Jesus means, I think, in this very passage when he says, love your enemy. And it's significant that he does not say, like your enemy. Like is a sentimental something, an affectionate something. And there are a lot of people that I find difficult to like. I don't like what they do to me. I don't like what they say about me and other people. I don't like their attitudes. I don't like some of the things they're doing. I just don't like them. But Jesus says, love them. And love is greater than like. Love is understanding, redemptive goodwill for all men so that you love everybody because God loves them. You refuse to do anything that will defeat an individual because you have agape in your soul. And here you come to the point that you love the individual who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. This is what Jesus means when he says, love your enemy. This is the way to do it. When the opportunity presents itself, you can defeat your enemy. You must not do it. Now, it's not only necessary to know how to go about loving your enemies, but also to go down into the question of why we should love our enemies. I think the first reason that we should love our enemies, and I think this was at the very center of Jesus's thinking, is this, that hate for hate only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the universe. If I hit you and you hit me and I hit you back and you hit me back and go on, you see, that goes on ad infinitum. It just never ends. Somewhere somebody must have a little sense. And that's the strong person. The strong person is the person who can cut off the chain of hate, the chain of evil. And that is the tragedy of hate that it doesn't cut it off. It only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the universe. Somebody must have religion enough and morality enough to cut it off and inject within the very structure of the universe that strong and powerful element of love. Some time ago, my brother and I were driving one evening to Chattanooga, Tennessee from Atlanta. He was driving the car. And for some reason, the drivers were very discourteous that night. They didn't dim their lights. Hardly any driver that passed by dimmed his lights. And I remember very vividly, my brother A.D. looked over and in a tone of anger said, I know what I'm going to do. The next car that comes along here and refuses to dim the lights, I'm going to fail to dim mine and pour them on in all of their power. And I looked at him right quick and said, oh no, don't do that. There'd be too much light on this highway and it will end up in mutual destruction for all. Somebody's got to have some sense on this highway. Somebody must have sense enough to dim the lights. And that is the trouble, isn't it? That, is, that as all the civilizations in the world move up the highway of history, so many civilizations have looked at other civilizations that refuse to dim the lights. And they refuse to dim theirs. And Tornaby tells us that out of the 22 civilizations that have risen up, all but about seven have found themselves in the junk heap of destruction. It is because civilizations fail to have sense enough to dim their lights. And if someone doesn't have the sense enough to turn on the dim and beautiful and powerful lights of love in this world, the whole of our civilization will be plunged into the abyss of destruction. And we will end up destroying because nobody had any sense on the highway of history. 
Somewhere, somebody must have some sense. And it is all a descending spiral, ultimately sending in destruction for all and everybody. Somebody must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate and the chain of evil in the universe. And you do that by love. There's another reason why you should love your enemies. And that is because hate distorts the personality of the hater. We usually think of what hate does for the individual hated or the individuals hated or the groups hated. But it's even more tragic. It is even more ruinous and injurious to the individual who hates. You just begin hating somebody and you will begin to do irrational things. You can't see straight when you hate. You can't walk straight when you hate. You can't stand upright. Your vision is distorted. There's nothing more tragic than to see an individual whose heart is filled with hate. He comes to the point that he becomes a pathological case. For the person who hates, you can stand up and see a person and that person can be beautiful and you will call them ugly. For the person who hates, the beautiful become ugly and the ugly becomes beautiful. For the person who hates, the good becomes bad and the bad becomes good. For the person who hates, the true becomes false and the false becomes true. That's what hate does. You can't see right. The symbol of objectivity is lost. Hate destroys the very structure of the personality of the hater. And this is why Jesus says hate, that you want to be integrated with yourself. And the way to be integrated with yourself is to be sure that you meet every situation of life with an abounding love. Never hate, because it ends up in tragic neurotic responses. Psychologists and psychiatrists are telling us today, the more we hate, the more we develop guilt feelings, and we begin to subconsciously repress or consciously suppress certain emotions, and they all stack up in our subconscious selves and make for tragic neurotic responses. And may this not be the neuroses of many individuals as they confront life that is an element of hate there. And modern psychology is calling on us now to love. But long before modern psychology came into being, the world's greatest psychological psych psychologist who walked around the hills of Galilee told us to love. He looked at men and said, love your enemies, don't hate anybody. It's not enough for us to hate your friends, to love your friends, because when you start hating anybody, it destroys the very center of your creative response to life and the universe. So love everybody. Hate at any point is a cancer that gnaws away at the very vital center of your life and your existence. It is like eroding acid that eats away the best and the objective center of your life. So Jesus says love because hate destroys the hater as well as the hated. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Our world is in transition now. Our whole world is facing a revolution. Our nation is facing a revolution. Our nation. One of the things that concerns me most is that in the midst of the revolution of the world and in the midst of the revolution of this nation, is that we'll discover the meaning of Jesus' words. History, unfortunately, leaves some people oppressed and some people oppressors. And there are three ways that individuals who are oppressed can deal with oppression. One of them is to rise up against their oppressors with physical violence and corroding hatred. But, oh, this isn't the way. For the danger and the weakness of this method, it's futility. Violence creates many more social problems than it solves. 
And I've said in so many instances that as the Negro in particular and colored peoples all over the world struggle for freedom, if they succumb to the temptation of using violence in their struggle, unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness. And our chief legacy of, to the future will be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. Violence isn't the way. You could acquiesce and give in to resign yourself to the oppression. Some people do that. They discover the difficulties of the wilderness of moving into the promised land. And they'd rather go back to the despots of Egypt because it's difficult to get into the promised land. And so they resign themselves to the fate of oppression. They somehow acquiesce to this thing. But that too isn't the way because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as it is cooperation with good. But there is another way, and that is to organize mass nonviolent resistance based on the principle of love. It seems to me that this is the only way as our eyes look to the future. As we look out across the years and across the generations, let us develop and move right here. We must discover the power of love the power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way. Jesus discovered that. Not only did Jesus discover it, even great military leaders discover that. One day as Napoleon came toward the end of his career, and look back across the years, the great Napoleon that at a very early age had all but conquered the world. He was not stopped until he became, till he moved out to the battle of Leipzig and then to Waterloo. But that same Napoleon one day stood back and looked across the years and said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have built great empires, but upon what did they depend? They depended upon force. But long ago, Jesus started an empire that depended on love. And even to this day, millions will die for him. And I'm proud to stand here this morning and say that that army is still marching. It grew up from a group of 11 or 12 men to more than 700 million today. Because of the power and influence of the personality of this Christ, he was able to split history into AD and BC. Because of his power, he was able to shake the hinges from the gates of the Roman Empire. And all around the world this morning, we can hear the glad echo of heaven ring, Jesus shall reign, Wherever sun does its successive journeys run, his kingdom spreads from shore to shore till moon shall wane and wax no more. We can hear another chorus singing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. We can hear another chorus singing, hallelujah, hallelujah, he's king of kings and lord of lords. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We can hear another choir singing, in Christ there is no east or west. In him, no north or south, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide world. This is the only way. And our civilization must discover that. Individuals must discover that as they deal with other individuals. There is a little tree planted on a little hill. On that tree hangs... Okay, can we... Yeah, start that over again. <laughs> and our civilization must discover that. Individuals must discover that as they deal with other individuals. There is a little tree planted on a little hill, and on that tree hangs the most influential character that ever came in this world but never feel that that tree is a meaningless drama that took place on the stages of history. Oh no, 
It is a telescope through which we look out into the long vista of eternity and see the love of God breaking forth into time. It is an eternal reminder to a power drunk generation that love is the only way. It is an eternal reminder to a generation depending on nuclear and atomic energy, a generation depending on physical violence, that love is the only creative, redemptive, transforming power in the universe. So this morning, as I look into your eyes and into the eyes of all of my brothers in Alabama and all over America and all over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And I am foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant bent will be transformed. And then we will be in God's kingdom. We will be able to matriculate into the university of eternal life because we have the power to love our enemies, to bless those people that cursed us, to even decide to be good to those persons who hate us. And, e and we even pray for those persons who despitefully used us. Oh God, help us in our lives and in all of our attitudes to work out this controlling force of love, this controlling power that can solve every problem that we confront in all areas. Oh, we talk about politics. We talk about the problems facing our atomic civilization. Grant that all men will come together and discover that as we solve the crisis and solve these problems, the international problems, the problems of atomic energy, the problems of nuclear energy, and yes, even race problem, let us join together in great fellowship of love and bow down at the feet of Jesus. Give us this strong determination. In the name and spirit of this Christ we pray. Amen.